Oh, maybe so we can sleep in there. Right now. Well, good afternoon. It is exactly 4 o'clock, so we're going to uh, get started. There are a little over 70 people here, and that's 70 more than we expected at 4 o'clock on a Friday afternoon. So we appreciate you sticking it out and joining us. I am Dr. Nancy Cross. I'm Section Chief for Reporting and Analysis uh, for the Department of Public Instruction in North Carolina. I know our state set things up differently, so we're the K-12 agency um, in North Carolina. And Misty is our lead curriculum instructional management coordinator and data analyst. Uh, we have a long history together. Um, Misty, and we're going to play tag with our presentation today, but uh, she was a CDC at a high school when I became director in a district. So we served together for a while in that capacity, then she became my CIMC. Then when I transitioned to another district as director in North Carolina, uh, she became the director in Randolph County, where the position I left, and it felt great to leave it in good hands. But then she transitioned <laughs> to the department, uh, and then I shortly followed. So we have been together for many years. Uh, I used to say things in stakeholder meetings about, well, we'll do that, and the we was, Misty was the mouse in my pocket. Uh, so we meant, we will do that. So. We're excited to be here today to talk to you about data. Uh, usually when I talk to groups about data, there's half the room that's there because they don't feel good about data. They don't like data. They never like data. But they think if I just go to one more session, maybe something will click. Maybe something useful will come from that. And then there's a group of people who are like me and enjoy data. Uh, it's my whole life. I, I am perfectly content to sit in uh, my home office with um, several monitors, we call it the command center, and have multiple spreadsheets up and pivot tables, and it's just a lot of fun for me, so I enjoy that. So I think that uh, you will probably fall in one or the other of these categories. Either you eat data for breakfast, you love it, constantly doing data, or you feel like you can't be told the data's wrong if you don't track it. <laughs> Why bother tracking it? So I'm not going to ask you to commit to one side or the other, but I feel like that probably one of those uh, resonates with you. So our objectives today are to think about and understand how internal and external data sources can be used to discover the impact of your CTE programs. If you're not looking at your data, you really, other than intuition, that gut feeling, you don't know what's working and what's not working. Um, to apply three different strategies, uh, ranking, comparison, and analysis to craft an effective narr narrative to share with your stakeholders. If we say to our stakeholders that our 1S1 data says that 98% of our CTE concentrators graduate on time, if you don't give them something to compare that to, they don't know if that's good, bad, or indifferent. 98% sounds great, but if 99% of your non-CTE concentrators are graduating, then you're not doing very well, right? So you have to you have to 
put it in perspective for them. And then to explore or think about some data visualization tools that can enhance the delivery of your CTE story. This is a quote that resonates with me. Uh, it's at the core of my philosophy around data. Things get done only if the data we gather can inform and inspire those in a position to make a difference. I can produce beautiful data reports all day long, but if I don't, don't then share that with stakeholders, as a director, I would share it with my high school principals or my chamber of commerce or my industry partners, uh, and now at the state level, if I don't get that to my CT directors across the state in such a way that they can then turn around and use it with their stakeholders uh, and influence the influencers, right? There are people who can take that data and put it into action. In many cases, as a director or in the role that I'm in now, I can't do the work, but I can inform and inspire those who are doing the work. And so that's my, my goal with the data. So when we think about internal and external data sources, and of course some of this you would make relative to your state, uh, internally we look at our concentrators. Uh, we in North Carolina have established a definition that a concentrator is a student who has completed two or three courses in a pathway, the um, last of which is a level two course. Some of our pathways require three courses, like carpentry. They have to take um, core and then carpentry one and carpentry two. Other pathways are just two course pathways. So that concentrator list. We do a concentrator follow-up survey for 3S1. Uh, folks across the nation do that in many different ways, how you figure out what your kids are doing after they've graduated. And I'll say, because I see some of you writing, uh, and feel free to do that, but also know that at the end we're going to give you a, a bit.ly so you'll have access to the slides right away. Um, and then we have a credential report. We, for our state, do an um, annual report around our credential attainment. Um, proof of learning results, we evaluate students' um, mastery of content three different ways. We have good old standardized 100 question multiple choice tests, we call those post assessments. There are only about 34 of our courses in our state left that use uh, a post assessment. Uh, and we have transitioned many of our courses to one of two other POL categories, either credential as proof of learning, so in some cases an industry recognized credential serves as that final proof of learning, or we have developed a um, performance-based measure, so it's really a portfolio students work on, it's authentic uh, across the whole semester, and it demonstrates their mastery of the content um, through that PBM. And then we share with them a CTE data workbook with directors. Uh, those are our internal, internal data sources. And then we also have some CTE links that take you to places on DPI's website um, where you can get some comparison data, like economically disadvantaged percentages across districts across the state, or EL uh, population, graduation rates, those sorts of things. And then external data sources. Um, so when we, for instance, with our two S's, 2S1, two 2, and 3, when we want to compare how our concentrators are doing on biology or English 2 or math 1 or 3 as compared to students who aren't CTE concentrators. So we provide those links to our directors so they can make those comparisons internally as well. So we know in CTE that we're data rich, and I'm sure that you all are data rich as well. And if you access some of those external data sources in your own state, you'll find that that data can in turn give you much more leverage with telling your story. But we know that in order for us to tell a good story, we have to take that, that data, turn it into information that's useful, and then that information can then be turned into insight. And so that's what our goal is this afternoon. So before we start going through some of the strategies, we wanted to cover some of the, the keys to communicating data. And these are no-brainers, uh, but just wanted to make sure that, that we address that you have to know who your audience is, right? 
you have to understand who it is that you're going to be communicating that data to so that you'll know how to make sense of it, how to send the message that you want to send about your program. We want to make sure that we can communicate the meaning behind the numbers because just as Nancy said earlier, some of us aren't as comfortable with data and some of us can't make sense of it and so we have to be sure that we can communicate that meaning behind the data as we share it with our stakeholders. Of course, if you can build some longitudinal data to show trends, that's great. Um, and it may be something that you have to start doing now to get to that point. We also think that it's important to be transparent because sometimes we kind of get that itch to brag on our programs and to, to try to only show the, the positives or to, you know, make us stand out from others. But it's very important to ensure that you're being transparent about the data. There's nothing wrong with addressing an issue as long as you can explain that and make sense of it. So those are just uh, some key keys to communicating data. So we're going to go ahead and jump into some of the strategies. So the first one that we're going to talk about is ranking. So if we look at ranking, we're talking about providing some type of context so that the numbers have a clearer meaning or some type of significance. So we're going to give you an example. Where I come from, and Nancy and I both live in the same county, we are in the heart of North Carolina in Randolph County. Um, our school district has consistently been one of the top 10 districts in the state in terms of the numbers of credentials that our students earn since we began tracking credential data. And so if you look at our, our county map, there's 100 counties in North Carolina, 15 city school systems, so 115 public school units that we work with. And Randolph County in the center of North Carolina has consistently been in the top 10. So that's, that is a ranking that sounds pretty impressive, right? But can we take that data and make it a little bit stronger? So we already have a good data point. But let's think about, and I'm, you wouldn't know this about North Carolina, I want you to think about it in your own state. So if we were to look at the fact that Randolph County is the 23rd largest school system out of 115 in our state, we would expect that they should be around the 23rd highest earning credentials proportionally, right? But Randolph County in our last credential report was eighth in the state. So we're the 23rd largest school system and we're the eighth highest earning credentials for our students. So that's, that's a pretty significant data point that you can share with your stakeholders. It's great to be able to say that you're a top 10 district, but then to be able to compare that to your size and make a more significant argument for your success in your district or, your, or, or where you are in the state, that makes a little bit more sense to your stakeholders. So we would invite you at this time to think about how you might tell something about your CTE program using ranking. So think for just a moment about how you might share what you might share about your CTE program using ranking. And if you'd like, you can turn to one of your elbow partners or a, a small group wherever you're sitting and just have a, a minute or two of discussion about what you might could share in terms of ranking. We, we shared an example about credentials. You may have something else that you'd like to share. Yes, ma'am. We collect this data. Yes. Yes. So, go ahead. No, go ahead. Yeah, so we, co we collect our credit, we collect our proof of learning data, all of the data that we collect for our performance indicators, we collect. And we have a, um, a computerized management system, a portal where our districts report those credential results. We collect proof of learning results, credential results. So we collect all of that data from our districts. And then Nancy is in charge <laughs> of reporting that out uh, both at the state level and at the federal level. So we, we manage that data. Okay, so the invitation is for you to think about how you might share something or what you may share about your CTE program using ranking.
Anyone interested in sharing a data point that they talked about that they might use ranking to add perspective? Anybody want to share? use my teacher voice. I was thinking the percentage of CTE students that graduate compared to regular high school students. Yep. And also, what else did we say? Um, no, I think I leave. That's a very good one. Yep, how do your CTE, either participants or concentrators, how does their graduation rate compare to non-CTE participants and or concentrators? Very good. <clears throat> oh, yes. Right. How many CTE students go on then to um, put either positions or to continue post secondary in the field of study that they uh, entered in in high school? Very good. All right, so the second method we're going to talk about is comparison. So comparison creates this sense of value by demonstrating the impact of a specific metric. Um, this is a pretty good statement. Across the state, over 39% of the CT concentrators are what North Carolina calls career and college ready in re reading li language arts, according to our ESSA plan. So our students who take what we call end of course tests, final exams that are standardized across the state um, in English 2 for reading language arts, get a score that translates to a level, level 1 through 5. You have to be a level 3 to be proficient, but you have to be a level 4 or 5 to be career and college ready. Now when we see 39%, there's really nothing about 39% when we think about a percentage scale of 0 to 100. Nothing about 39% says get excited, right? But when we make a comparison, to the overall performance in our state on the English 2 exam, only 30, where is it? We ex 34.9% of students in the whole state earn a level four or five. So our CTE students who are concentrators by the end of grade 10, so they've gone through a level two CTE class by the end of grade 10, outperform students who have not completed a CTE pathway by the end of grade 10. <clears throat> To go even another later, layer, and I don't think we included this slide, but to go another later, layer, when we look at our most impacted, some of our most impacted subgroups, like our English learners and our Hispanic males, um, economically disadvantaged students, the gap's even wider. The impact is even greater. So, when we think about comparison, comparing how, for instance, and, and ranking and comparison, sometimes there's a, a, certainly a bleed over on those two, but when you start thinking about how you would make comparisons with some of your performance data or other CTE data, what comparisons would you use? So, if you would um, have that conversation again with those around you. Something that you would use comparison in telling your CTE story.
long until there's a light. Would anyone like to share something about your CTE program that you could compare data points or you would be interested in? Somebody say yes. Anybody want to share with the group something that you thought of? Dropout rate. Dropout rate? Yeah, that's a great one. So one of the things that I love about comparison is typically when you're trying to compare groups of CTE students against non-CTE students, because that's really where we want to try to show the impact, your data that includes your non-CTE students is typically your entire population. It's not, it's not always easy to tease those non-CTE students out. So when you look at this example, this comparison, we're talking about a four and a half, and this, this is real data from our, from our state. So we're talking about a four and a half percentage point difference in our CTE concentrators as opposed to the overall population. Think about how much greater that gap would be if we teased out those CTE concentrators and you really could compare non-CTE students to CTE students. The impact is even greater. So thinking about ways that you can compare your CTE student performance to your overall population may help you find some nuggets to showcase the impact of CTE in your district or your state. So the last one that we want to talk about is our favorite, and this is where we really can get down in the weeds and spend a lot of time looking for trends or um, just ahas in the data. So an analyzing data, it sounds fancy, but it's really nothing more than taking multiple data sources and making a larger connection. And oftentimes when you analyze data, it becomes or can become a call to action, which is what we're all about. We want to improve the lives of our students and of our economies. And so in this example, this is one that, that Nancy and I love to share, is if we look at our um, ethnicity groups in our state, uh, we're gonna highlight black students. And so let me give you just a little bit of background about our credentials, the way that we collect credential data. So uh, our credentials are aligned to a course, so they align to the course standards. And then we work with commerce to apply a tiered ranking system to our credentials. So we have tier one, two, and three. Tier one is what we would consider a foundational level credential. It's oftentimes a student's first experience in earning a credential and may whet their appetite to see what it's like to earn a credential and may encourage them to consider stackable credentials. So a tier one credential um, has probably the least amount of academic rigor and probably the least amount of value in the workplace. A tier two credential uh, would be that middle level, and it's what we call like a door opener type credential. So it may be a credential that would get a student an interview for a position. Maybe not be something that they have to have to perform the job, but something that could help them. Uh, and, and our tier two credentials actually earn bonuses for our teachers. So our teachers can earn bonuses based on how many tier two credentials our students earn. And then tier three are those advanced credentials that are often required for certain positions. And so uh, those would be the highest level of academic rigor and the highest workplace value. So just wanted to give you that background before we go through this example. Okay, yeah, so, uh, so if we look at the health science pathway, um, CPR, first aid, those are considered tier one credentials for us. Okay, most students can achieve that pretty easily in the classroom. Uh, it gives them a taste for what it's like to earn a credential. You know, many of them, it's their, their first experience. They're proud of that. And then they get a sense of, I can do this. A tier three credential in that pathway would be nurse aid, our North Carolina nurse aid credential. 
So that would be something that a student would be required to have to go into that particular job. Or pharmacy technician. Yes, ma'am. I probably shouldn't have said that. No, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah, and, and you uh, chime in if I miss anything. So um, our, our um, General Assembly has funded for our teachers um, those bonuses. So the student must be enrolled in that teacher's class. The teacher, of course, has to have all of the, the requirements in terms of their certification to be able to offer that credential. Um, and then as we collect that data, we talked about earlier how we collect that data in our portal. If the student earns that credential while they're enrolled in that academic year, then that teacher earns a bonus for each student. So for example, if, uh, if our uh, nursing fundamentals teacher certifies 10 students in the nurse aid, the North Carolina nurse aid, they would earn that bonus for each of those 10 students. So if the bonus was $25 per student, then that teacher would earn $250 for that group of students. We do have a cap is it $3,500? $3,500 per academic year is the cap that any teacher could earn. So it's just, a, it's just a small incentive to, you know, help encourage teachers to provide those additional opportunities for students. Because we know that in, in many cases it requires some additional work. Um, so did that answer your question? Okay, great. Okay, so in this example, if we look at our ethnicity groups, we're going to look at our black students, and if we look at the percentage of our credentials that are earned across the tiers, so tier one, tier two, and tier three, we can see that our black students are earning a little over 15% tier one credentials, uh, just shy of 10% tier two, and about six and a half, a little more than six and a half percent of tier three. If we were to share that data with our stakeholders, it really doesn't mean a whole lot. We could try to make some comparisons among the other groups, but it still doesn't really have any significance because we don't really know what the big picture is. So if we begin to analyze the data and pull in those multiple sources, we're gonna take a look at our enrollment data. So if we look statewide at our enrollment in our CTE courses, Statewide, our black students make up a little over 25% of our enrollment. So wouldn't we expect that black students would earn about 25% of the credentials that are earned? But when we look at our tier three credentials, they're only earning 6.7%. That's where the call to action comes in. That's when we can start to ask ourselves the question, why is that? Why might that be? What other factors play a role in that data? Is it an equity and access issue? Is it a course enrollment issue? What's going on? Why does the data present itself in this way? So do you see how important it is to think about the multiple data sources and how you might pull those in and then you can use some of those comparison strategies or maybe ranking strategies along with some analysis to identify some areas where you might could improve. This is where that transparency comes in. So we would like to invite you, did I cover everything we needed to cover on that one? Okay, so we would like to invite you to, again, one more time, have some conversation with your colleagues in the room around what types of things might you be interested in analyzing in your school or district or state that could help you discover a call to action. Yeah, do you have any questions about our... This, ex this particular example, and I didn't go through all the numbers, you can see them here, so 25% of our state enrollment, pretty close to our CTE enrollment statewide. Our special populations coordinator 
is in the room, and we work very closely with her. We're working on it, aren't we, Shannon? We're working. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, great point. So, there's only so much that we can do at the state level because, as Nancy mentioned, we, we can't do the work. But helping our districts, number one, find the data that they need, provide them with the data that they need, and help support them in that analysis to help them make those discoveries so that they can begin those conversations in their districts because they're the ones that can do the work. They're the ones that can influence that work locally. Just by show of hands, how many of you have either heard of or participated in opportunity gap analysis training through advanced CTE? Awesome. Has it been effective? And yeah, so uh, Shannon and I did the training a couple years ago and now we train our districts. We start with just enrollment data. You have to start somewhere, but we leave them with what about? What about your credentials? What about your CTSO enrollment? Um, what about an, an even broader picture? Because we make them bring cross-curricular teams to the, the meetings. Sometimes a principal might they say, oh, I need to go back and look at my AP enrollment. Whatever it might be. Ex access and equity begins by looking at a comparison population, not just what it seems like or what it feels like ought to be happening, but what ought to be happening. In this scenario, uh, when you look at, and female students, the gap there is brought up, when you look at the fact that female students make up 48.7% of the state's enrollment and 466 of the CTE participant enrollment, there's not really a gap there. That's We're, we're in line. Usually you look for about 10 percentage points or more before you throw a red flag. Um, so we're good there. But when you look across the credentialing, and remember what Misty described to you is the value of the credential increases with each tier. And why is it that our female students who are half of our enrollment are only earning 22.6% of our most valuable credentials? It gets even more disturbing when we look at our economically disadvantaged students who might not have the opportunity to go to a four-year college and that industry recognized credential might be the separation for them from that entrapment, economic entrapment but that they might have been caught in generationally. And we're not credentialing them at the same rate for tier three, the most valuable credentials. But it goes back to the quote of inspiring those who can make a difference. I've never credentialed anybody. But I worked in Randolph County, and when I started there, we were 11th in the state for credentialing. And I was determined we were going to get on that top 10 list that's published every year. And we have, and they have now maintained that for a long time. But this, I didn't get to this level. Sometimes they need, they being CTE directors or teachers, they need someone to help them think about the data in a way that can be impactful where there are opportunity gaps. And that's what they are, folks. They're, you know, we, um, what's the, the other gap that we call it? Oh, uh, uh, performance gap. No, these kids aren't having a chance for the same performance because they're not being offered the opportunity. Therefore, it's an opportunity gap, right? Not an achievement gap. That's the, the one that used to get down my call. Achievement gaps. No. It's an opportunity gap. Yeah, any, any feedback, input, comments, thoughts from you guys? <clears throat> so getting the data in a digestible way to them and doing it with love and support, of course, and not just then leaving them out there on a limb to say, hey, your numbers are messed up, fix it, but working with them to establish what are the root causes so OGA people know where I'm going with that. What are the root causes? And then you look at proven strategies that you already know are research-based and have been proven to work, and then you develop an action plan and you implement that, right? So that's how you make a difference uh, with the data and the, the concept of that call to action. Not just bragging on your programs. This is where sometimes you're uh, peeling back the layers 
and looking at the not very pretty parts of your programs that can uh, lead to an impact. All right. So we talked earlier about sources. Is this me or you? Okay. We talked earlier about sources and that uh, there are internal and external sources. We also have internal and external stakeholders. So who do you share the data with? And on one of Misty's slides, she talked about um, the key um, points about sharing your data, and one of the very first ones was to know your audience. So you certainly need to have internal conversations. When I was working to improve my credentialing numbers, I started talking to all my teachers in program area groups about the credentials that were available. And I'd have teachers say things like, oh, I didn't know that credential was in my area. What? You're teaching the course and you don't know that that credential's on. That was disturbing. But I hid that part of my reaction and I just said, yes, you can offer that credential. And we got excited about it and they did. And, and then I would have teachers say, oh, I've been offering that credential for years. I didn't know I was supposed to report it somewhere. <laughs> what? So you just hang on to that. But you have the conversations based on who your audience is, right? So there's data you share with teachers. There's data that you share with other teachers, okay? Your math and science and um, English teachers for 2S1, 2, and 3 need to know how much better their CTE concentrators are doing on their test than the kids who haven't been exposed to CTE because sometimes, and I come from a math background, sometimes we have what I call academic snobs, right? And they think that CTE is just for those kids. Well, let me tell you something. Those kids are doing better on your test than your kids, right? So sharing the data with other teachers as well. Sometimes you share it with the students. Students have gotten program to believe if I'm going to a four-year college, I can't take court two. If I'm going to a four-year college, I can't take, um, I can't take ag mechanics, whatever the class might be. But they need to see the data as well. I do principal, I did as a director, principal dives, data dives with principals. When I tell principals that our 1S1, which is graduation, four-year cohort graduation rate, that if an EL student is a CTE concentrator, they're 30 percentage points more likely to graduate in four years than non-CTE concentrators, you better believe those principals are then interested in who's taking CTE classes, if that's going to improve their graduation rate. Okay. School counselors, got to work on them sometimes too. Love our school counselors, super important. Any school counselors in here? No. Yep, a couple. <laughs> Love our Misty, Misty school counselor background. I've always, that's always been a great um, layer to her and her work. But, but our school counselors need to understand the importance of CTE and what the data tells us. Uh, and then, of course, your superintendent. I, I constantly, as a CTE director, fed data to my superintendent. And then I would hear that. I would hear it in his, his monthly YouTube videos he did. I would hear it at the board meetings. I would hear it when he talked to the Chamber of Commerce. Did you know that 98.6% of our CTE students graduated on time, as opposed to 95% of our non-CTE students? So you would hear that um, come back out. And then who are your external stakeholders and the importance of sharing your data there as well. So we wanted to talk for just a few minutes around data visualization tools. I know many of you have probably seen, or you may even have in your state, some fancy data dashboards and some other uh, really nice graphics that can help visualize the data. While those tools are excellent, they're not always intended for the audience that you are trying to reach. In many cases, we find that some of those data visualization tools are for you as a consumer of the data to make sense of and try to uh, identify some of those areas that you want to share with your stakeholders. Um, but we, we outlined just four basic categories of data visualization tools and just want to show you a couple of examples to get you thinking about how you might present your data depending on who your stakeholders are. 
So the first example that we have are just graphs and charts. I'm sure many of you have used those before. If you are maintaining data sets in Microsoft Excel, you can very easily turn those into charts and graphs. So if you'll just go ahead and go to that one. So just some basic, you know, you just select your data and you can choose. It'll even tell you what's the best way to visualize that data. So the one on the left is uh, just our duplicated enrollment of students by program area. So you can very quickly see that our computer science, IT, and technology education has the highest student enrollment, duplicated enrollment. Just an easy way that you can visualize data. I'm, sh I'm sure you all have used pie charts, graphs, things like that. The one on the right is... Um, one that we have <laughs> grown to love uh, more recently, it might not mean a whole lot to you, but to help make sense of this, we, we plotted, so our, our CTE state assessments, our final exams, our secure state assessments, um, our state board policy says that the students can only take that within a certain window of time. And we have allowed our districts a longer window of makeups so that if a student wasn't there during that exam week, if they were sick, or if they were out of town, whatever, that they could then make that exam up. And what Nancy likes to say is oftentimes we will have that gut feeling of it seems like, but then we don't have any data to back it up. So this is what we did with this data. It seemed like a lot of our districts were chasing down students and pulling them out of their next semester classes to make up tests that they didn't take from the first semester. Or asking them to come in the first day of summer break to make up a test. So we analyzed that data to see student performance based on how far away from the makeup or how far, how far away from the exam date they were supposed to take that exam. So as you see here, um, our, our exam window date, somewhere around 74% proficiency, I believe, and you can see as you get further and further away from the exam window, student proficiency just tanks. So we were able to use this information with our districts statewide to help implement a better process for getting students to either make up their exams or define a testing window. So just another example of way that, ways that you can visualize the data. Another one that we like is heat maps. And you can certainly take graphs or uh, uh, cells of information in Excel and use conditional formatting to highlight certain things so that you can visually see. One of the things that we like to do around enrollment data for programs is to just throw it onto our, our state map so that you can see these are all of the counties or school districts in our state that offer STEM programs, for example. So if our state superintendent wants to know how many programs we have or how many schools are implementing those programs, she can very easily see which parts of the state have those programs. So a heat map is another easy way. This was generated in about 30 seconds in Microsoft Excel, pretty simple. So that's another way that you can visualize data. Well, I don't know what's going up there, what's going on up there in the Northeast, but that would that would be an area of concern, right? I mean, you guys probably all see that very quickly. You know, you might have some spots here and there where you don't have a STEM program, but the Northeast region of our state, very, very sparse. Now, I will tell you the Northeast part of our state is traditionally econ economically disadvantaged, um, little ac less access to resources and it's it's just it's been a generational type thing i mean there's improvements happening there we have some great things happening in the northeast that could be part of it you know without really diving further into it oh 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 yeah yeah so so that the the green section that you see in the middle that's east carolina university so you, we have a major university there, so that, that might make sense why you would have a robust program there. <laughs> Misty will get me later for putting her on the spot like that, but she did a great job with that analysis. <laughs> but that's another, we certainly use heat maps to just visually be able to say, hey, here, here's where our STEM programs, but then we can do more analysis and dig into that deeper. If I'm a director in the Northeast and I looked at that map, I might get concerned, why, why do I not have STEM programs? I mean, my kids might need them more than anybody and access to those opportunities. So 
Uh, they serve lots of ways. If you're familiar with David McCandless, he uh, did the billion dollar a gram uh, graph just because he didn't, he's a, he's a data journalist and struggled with understanding the concept of billions of dollars and what 314 billion, how does that compare to 718 billion, what does that look like? So you can look up that graph uh, and it's a lot of fun, but I just playing around on BI one day, and this is not, I call them client ready. This is not client ready. It's not something I would put out, but it's pretty cool to, cool to see that when I put in our 300, 325,784 individual credentials our students earned in 22-23, this is what it looks like. So we have some down here that are teeny tiny where maybe only one kid in the whole state earned a particular credential, but then we have some that uh, thousands of kids earned. So our ANSI, which is accredited food handler and food manager um, in our foods one and two classes and some of our culinary arts classes, uh, tons of kids earned. And some people say, well, that's a pretty meaningless credential. You're proud of that? Yeah, we're proud of it, considering that about 75% of adults 25 and under at some point work in the food industry. I, I want to know that they know how to handle my food safely. So I am excited about that credential. Uh, but again, it's not necessarily client ready, but certainly a nice visual. And then Misty created this one. I said, you should talk about it because you created it. She said, I don't care about that. <laughs> and she doesn't. And that's a wonderful way that she gives in her role. But what I will say is that we provide this to our districts. This is our state data. We give it to them in a fillable form so that they essentially can take all of their performance indicator data and put it in one visually pleasing place to then hand out at advisory council meetings and chamber of commerce and to industry partners and to economic development folks uh, to say that our graduation rate was 98% for our CTE concentrators, the overall, and remember Misty pointed out a few minutes ago, that includes our CTE students, Overall, it's only 86% of on-time graduation. That's what make the, makes that 98 even more impressive, right? Um, how many participants we had that year, how many students earned a concentration that year. This is two years ago, so I mentioned that we went from uh, to 325,000 this past year, but two years ago it was 239,000 individual credentials earned. Here's our academic proficiency down the middle. Uh, credential attainment, that's how many of our concentrators earned a credential, not just any credential, a credential in their pathway of concentration. So that went from 37 to, it was well over 40 uh, this past year, but improved, yes. <laughs> yeah, so this was created in Adobe Illustrator. And then we just converted that to a fillable PDF for them. So uh, when you have get, the, get access to the slides, you can access the template. And we just made that where they could just simply go in and enter their numbers for their district. And it would mimic this, um, but would, would have their individual district's data. You could use Canva. Uh, there's lots of other resources out there. I just am more comfortable with Adobe Illustrator, and that's what I like to play with. So that's where this came from. Yes, so if, if you were to access this template, then they would have a place, uh, they would, there would be a box for them to enter their district at the top where it says CTE at a glance, where the 98% is, they would put their percentage. Everything else is there, they would just put the numbers in. And we provide that to them in that CTE data workbook, so it's easy for them to access. Yeah, we provide them their state data for their um, performance indicators. And Misty will do a new one every year. So we have a 2020-2021 we have a at a glance. And, and she does it in with a black background so it looks really good in a slide presentation and with a white background in case you want to print it because nobody wants to print that thing out, right? So we hope, and we know you must uh, care a little bit about data to be here at 4 on a Friday. And for us from North Carolina, it feels like 6 o'clock, uh, or now almost 6.45. So we appreciate you being here. Uh, there's the link, the QR code, and the link to the 
uh, presentation. There's our contact information. We're always happy to engage uh, with you in any way that we can. And I just appreciate you and the work that you do. So happy data diving.